Okay, so data parallelism. So this is what it's all about, really. Um, yeah, so obviously we want to use offloading devices because it allows us to uh, do stuff in parallel. So yeah, this is important. So in this uh, section, we're going to learn about task parallelism and data parallelism, learn about the SPMD uh, model for describing data parallelism. So there's the single process, multiple data um, uh, model, this kind of uh, Flynn's taxonomy thingy my bub. Um, learn about single uh, stickle execution of memory models, learn about enqueuing kernel functions with parallel four. Okay, so task parallelism is where you have several possibly distinct tasks executing in parallel. In task parallelism, you par parallelism, you optimize for latency. We want low latency. Data parallelism is where you have the same task being performed on multiple elements of data. In data parallelism, you optimize for throughput. So we're mostly kind of dealing with uh, data parallelism here. Um, Many processors are vector processors, which means that they can naturally perform data parallelism. GPUs are designed to be parallel. CPUs have SIMD instructions, which perform the same instruction on a number of elements of data. Okay, so you can see your normal sequential CPU code doing some sort of a loop. Okay, and then a parallel SPMD code. Uh, and then we're just defining this for a single iteration in this kind of iteration uh, space. And you're doing a parallel four for this. Okay, so in SQL, kernel functions are executed by individual work items. So these are the smallest unit of work, okay, work items. So this is equivalent to in CUDA, you might call them threads. Uh, you can think of a uh, work item as a thread of execution, yeah. Each work item will execute a SQL kernel function from start to end. Uh, a work item can run on CPU threads, SIMD lines, CPU threads, or any other kind of processing element, yeah. Okay, so work items are collected together into work groups. Okay, so um, again, uh, with your CUDA hat on, this would be equivalent to threads and uh, blocks. Okay, so this is some uh, work group is a collection of work items and you can dictate the size of this work group. So the size of the work groups is generally relative to what is optimal on the device being targeted. Um, yeah, so you don't need to specify work group size, but you can manually specify uh, if you want, but if not, then there are some heuristics to choose uh, good, good work group size. Um, it can be also affected by the resources used by each work item. Yes. Okay, so SQL kernel functions are invoked within an ND range, okay? So essentially this work item is uh, grouped in a, a work group, and then this um, in turn is kind of whatever inside uh, uh, this, the, the next step up in the hierarchy is the ND range. So in CUDA, this would correspond to threads, blocks, and then a grid. So an ND range uh, is composed of the dimension of the work group, as well as the global dimension, the global size, the global range. Okay. An ND range has a number of work groups and Subsequently, a number of work items. Work groups always have the same number of work items. Yes, so you can't have, say, I don't know, a work group here with X and another work group here with Y work items. They need to all agree. Um, and as well, when we're defining an ND range, uh, we do it in terms of the global range and the work group range. And we need to make sure that the work group range divides this global range or else you'll effectively be asking for um, uh, an irregular number of work items per work group. Okay, so this is um, an instance of an ND range. Okay, so this is the, the global range, 12, 12. So we're not uh, saying how many work groups we want, we're saying how many, um, how many work items in total in the global um, space we want. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, uh, 11, or yeah, sorry, 12, and then the same in that direction. So the number of work groups is inferred. Um, it's not handed to the constructor for an ND range. Uh, it could be one, two, or three dimensions. That's, that's important. So each of these could, could be one, two, or three dimensions. 
um, it has two components, the global range, this bit, and the local range. Okay, then the size of the work group, essentially. So multiple work items will generally execute concurrently. Uh, yeah, so usually on, um, on offload devices, it's useful to imagine that these are all happening. The, these are executing in complete lockstep. There's an ex there are exceptions to this, but uh, this is a good thing to have in your head when we're writing uh, code for offloading devices. So on vector hardware, this is often done in lockstep, which means that the same hardware instructions, uh, the number of work items that will execute can, uh, concurrently can vary from one device to another. Work items will be batched along with other work items in the same work group. The order work items and work groups are executed in is implementation defined. This is important. So essentially you could have um, a large uh, ND range where you think, well, it's, it's nice to um, uh, uh, kind of understand the work items as all executing in parallel, but in fact, you might have these uh, work groups executing and then those work groups and then more work groups and so on. So you need to make sure that any rights to say global memory or um, uh, yeah, that, that you're, you're not going to be, you need to be careful. We can't make assumptions that things are happening exactly at the same time. Okay, so work items in a work group can be synchronized using a work group barrier. Yeah, this is really important. So if you have some uh, work items in a work group executing, um, they might sort of fall out of lockstep. And also, if, especially if they're uh, larger work groups, uh, they might be executing concurrently um, or at the same time at all. So imposing a barrier uh, means that essentially all of the work groups need to uh, arrive to the same point before they can get to the next step. So this is done with the the um, the function barrier, which is a member function of, of uh, item or a, a work group. Um, Sickle does not support synchronizing across all work items in the ND range. Okay, this is also important. So we can't have a, a global sync of all work items in our ND range. Um, if this is something that we want, and this is something that we'll be seeing actually in the final exercise, if this is something that we want, then we're better off writing two separate kernels. So kernels, um, writing uh, different kernels, splitting the computation across multiple kernels, that's a way to guarantee some sort of global synchronization. You wait until something is completely finished, then you do a new kernel, you submit a new kernel. So each work item can access a dedicated region of private memory. So this is kind of like the, the registers that would be local to a particular work item. This is obviously very, very fast. Uh, it can access local memory, which is shared among a work group. So this in CUDA is shared memory. Um, so if this work item here writes to a value in local memory, then this work item can read it. But we need to be very, very careful that this uh, work item is only reading it after this one has written to it. So if we're writing and we want it to be read later, we might write, then do a barrier to make sure that everything is, has happened. And then um, we, we might read with, with the other work item. Um, we also have global constant memory, which is when we do a, a device malloc, this is the, the standard, um, well, global memory is certainly the standard. We can ask for constant memory using accessors. Uh, we need to ask for local memory using accessors. We'll do this at the end of the, the, next, um, the next lesson. Okay. Uh, and constant memory is read-only, but uh, we're not really going to be dealing with that uh, at the moment. Uh, also, so let's just say that this work item writes to global memory. And then this work item wants to read that exact same uh, thing that's been written into global memory. We can't do that safely. Uh, there's no way of doing that in a yeah in a, in a safe manner. So it's better to split this up into two separate kernels, where in the first kernel this thread writes to that, and then in the second kernel that value is read by some other thread by some other work item. Okay, so a parallel for. Okay, so um, we can. 
so this is a member function of a, a Kaban group handler, but we're just using a, a queue in our examples. So you define it on a range. Okay, this is just a normal range. It's not an ND range. So an ND range, so think nested, an ND range corresponds to defining the global range and also the work group size. In this case, we're just interested in the global range. So this is not an ND, an ND range. So um, into this uh, member function, you're, uh, sorry, into this Lambda, you're capturing things by value and you're uh, defining an, an, an index, um, uh, an index argument. And this index is really useful. This index can be, it essentially tells you the, the position of the thread uh, within this, this range of threads. Um, yes. Uh, okay. And we can see as well that this is a two dimensional range. And as a result, our IDs are two dimensional as well. Okay, so this is some two dimensional object. We can get the uh, individual dimensions by using just array access zero and array access one. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So this is taking a, a single ID, and this can be used to um, yeah find its position within the iteration space. Okay. So um, this is a parallel for taking a range object, and this is one dimensional, obviously. So the ID is one dimensional as well. Okay. Um, we can also, uh, so this is a sickle ID. This is just going to be a kind of sort of like a, a tuple, which is either a one, two, or a three tuple, um, which tells you the, the position of the thread within the space. Um, if you wanted to, you could also get a, a sickle item object. And this has a little bit, this, this has the same functionality as uh, an index, but it, it does even more um, than an index. So for instance, item has the member function barrier that you can use, and that's really useful. Uh, and you can do lots of things with items that you can't necessarily do with indexes. So uh, yeah, I would point you to the SQL spec to look at all the member functions, which are great. Okay, um, now in the final one, so we're using an ND range, so a nested range. Um, so you have your global range. So the entire global range is gonna be 1024 uh, by 1024. Sorry, no, it's just a, a, single, a single dimension. So it's just 1024. And then the work group size is gonna be 32. The local range is gonna be 32. And then you pass in an ND item, uh, which is um, similar to an item. I'm sorry, I said that item, you can use a barrier. You can't use a barrier with a, with a normal sickle item. With an ND item, you can use a, a sickle barrier because this means essentially synchronizing uh, in a particular work group. We don't necessarily have the concept of work groups here because we're not defining uh, uh, an ND range. We're just defining a, a sickle range. Okay. Um, yeah, and we can get lots of, nice stuff from this ND item. So this, yeah, again, points you to the sickle spec. Okay, questions? Are there work shuffles? Yes, yes, there are, yes. Um, um, yeah, you can, you can find this, this in the spec, uh, certainly. Where the, this is this is outside the scope of um, uh, the workshop today. Almost all um, CUDA features uh, are implemented in in DPC plus plus, and the ones that are the newest ones, these are the ones that we're currently working on. So they're they're like we are quite fast to to implement things. Definitely, um, yeah, uh, definitely consult the spec for we we can post this maybe in the um, in the Slack. Uh, we'll do, um, going back to slide 16, looks different from the PDF. Oh, really? Hmm. Uh, I don't have access. I don't have the PDF in front of me at the moment. Um. Any 
questions. So if you are going to have uh, if statements in the kernel, are they executed all in the style of the CUDA? Um, that's defined by the implementation. Um, in SQL code, if you have work items uh, reaching a barrier using kind of different branches, this is actually undefined behavior. But within um, with the DPC++ backend, uh, it's it, it usually agrees with the, the CUDA behavior. Uh, Gordon, is that correct? Am I? Yeah, so, so this is um, this is something that we're kind of working on, trying to expose a bit a bit better in the, in the CUDA back end at the moment. So the, the SQL spec currently works under the assumption that it doesn't make any guarantees about the execution of work items within the work group. They can you know, make progress in kind of in any way they like. So for a CUDA, you know, um, their CUDA architectures, they, they can move with independent forward progress. Um, but when it comes to certain operations like group based functions, so like work group level or subgroups or work level functions, these generally require, often require convergence or synchronization. Um, obviously, in CUDA execution model, then you can have, uh, there's a lot of features where you can have um, individual threads, you know, barriers and copies and things like that happen for individual threads rather than in warps. Um, that's something that's not exposed in PTP C++ or, or SQL at the moment, but we're, we're kind of working on that. It's, it'll require kind of expanding the current SQL execution model in order to kind of uh, be able to describe that, those capabilities. Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks for it. Yeah, since we're kind of a bit behind time, we might uh, jump into the next exercise. So essentially, um, okay, this is just a simple vector add, um, just using parallel fours. So we don't necessarily need to worry about um, ND ranges, just, just a global range will be fine. Okay, we have two vectors and we want to add them on device. Okay, and we'll be checking the, the result at the end. Okay, so compute this in parallel on the single device. So we need to construct a queue, allocate memory, copy memory to device, use a parallel for it to add the two arrays, transfer the memory back to the device. So yeah, we don't need to worry about an ND range. In this case, just a, a global range. So um, yeah, and then it, it might be worth mentioning as well that a global range we can construct it saying something like um, global range is equal to sickle range. Uh, might do one, okay, and then that has some size. Okay, yeah, so we'll get cracking on this one. This should be okay. Um, the next slides has some repeated material, but also uh, some new stuff. So we will hopefully fly through this and then we'll get to the more complex stuff um, using local memory and that kind of thing, barriers. So if anyone has any questions, post them in the Slack or um, okay, any relations? So the work group size. So no, the work group size is more um, akin to say block size. The it doesn't need to, um, you know, it, it's it's variable. It doesn't need to be exactly a warp or, um, but usually you want it to be multiples of, of a warp. Usually say 32, 64, 128, um, 256, so on. Yeah, one important uh, distinction between the CUDA grid and the single uh, ND range is that I think I'm correct in saying 
with a, a CUDA grid, you're saying you're specifying the number of blocks, whereas with the ND range, we don't specify the number of work groups. We just uh, specify the size of the, the global um, work item. Um, yeah, the uh, size, the global work item kind of grid size. What's the SQL equivalent uh, that calls CUDA stream synchronize? I suppose be uh, just just wait, I think, or, or calling it wait on uh, an event. So with our particular, um, the particular implementation, again, uh, maps a single queue to a, a string. So calling wait on a queue will just, uh, it'll wait on, it'll wait on uh, that particular stream, which is uh, put into good stream synchronize in the future when uh, this isn't the case and uh, queue maps to multiple uh, streams, then <coughs> you'll need to explicitly kind of list the, the events and then call wait on those, I think. Or you could you could build up a, a dependency graph within your within your application and then call wait on the, the last event or something like that. So you can kind of build these streams theoretically uh and then call wait on you know the last one of those <clears throat> what about CUDA device synchronize and is there a way to visualize the graph is there a way to visualize the graph as in is is there a nice tool to visualize the graph yes uh as far as i'm aware there is not as far as i'm aware someone correct me if i'm wrong uh, yeah, there's there's no way to kind of visualize the graph, but there is the PI trace tool, which is could give you the sort of gives you all the the calls to the the backend, which is not quite the same thing, but it's close. Yeah, I'll show you. So, where do I have a internet? Uh, so, uh, so just trying to find uh, we'll the Slack. A discussion about the name of the uh, the tracer. The name of the tracer. So we'll be we'll be looking at profiling tools uh, in the final section. Okay, so it will be there. Cool. It'll be there. It'll be there. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, we'll fly through the next section. Um, but just to um, echo what Gordon just said, so we have a, a PI tracer. Um, so the, the plugin interface again talks to the, the back end, uh, the plugin, whatever that might be. So you can, so essentially this is saying everything that the plugin interface is doing. Okay, just to do this very, very simple thing. Okay, so it, it gets a platform, gets another platform. No. Okay, so it gets multiple platforms. Uh, seems strange, but yeah, it, it does a lot of things. It gets the device info. Uh, so obviously you have some kind of a multiple calls to this device get, device retain, get info. So this is just get more info. Or, so these might be separate calls to get info. One is asking for something, another is asking for something else. A platform get info does something else. I, the, the plugin interface is doing a lot of things. So you can see how certainly the Sickle, um, the Sickle implementation is talking to the back end. So these are essentially messages passed to, uh, say, CUDA, and then it gets by successor or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, this can be useful for if you're if you think you're getting some kind of an error in um, in the way that the the plugin interface is is interacting with the uh, at the back end, or if you think that the, there's an error in the back end somewhere. Then you can easily locate it. Uh, when I say easily, these things are usually difficult to uh, find. Well, not always, not always, but yeah, uh, you can find it exactly what the plugin interface is doing just by using this uh, command. So sickle pi trace, and then you, there, there are multiple options. You do one as well. Uh, da -da -da. Okay. I think zero is maybe the default. Zero is the default, and then maybe a minus one as well. 
the minus one is not there, I think it's minus two. <coughs> Hey, how are we getting on? Do you have any questions? I have a question before we move on. Yeah. So um, we used only uh, scalars right now, but is it also possible to use complex um, object structures or classes? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can, you can use. So, yes, you, you, as long as you can, I, I think the, the, the definition is tri trivially copyable types, things that like, you know, don't have, say, nested pointers at point two, say, you know, parts of memory or whatever, as long as you can trivially copy something from host a device, uh, then you can use that in the kernel, absolutely. Um, so let's imagine I have a class that is that contains maps of string versus whatever. This is not going to be possible. But if it contains just like simple arrays, a multiple dimensional arrays, that's that's OK, right? Yes, yes. But you need to make sure that uh, these arrays are accessible to the, the to kernel code. You need to make sure that these are either malloced on device or uh, that you're not just passing pointers to say host memory on, um, you know, you need to, you need to make sure that these things exist on device memory. Gotcha. Yeah, cool. And yeah, that's, that's kind of a, a performance question as well in terms of, is it better to organize things in, ter in terms of uh, structs of arrays or arrays of structs? And usually the answer is, um, structs of arrays it's better to have kind of the same kind of data types in contiguous chunks as opposed to having arrays of structs which might have this and that and this and that and this and that uh usually for for optimization it's better to have yeah some sort of array style way of organizing things <laughs> okay let's see Okay, so yeah, constructing a queue, just a normal queue. Okay, allocating memory on the device. So we have a pointer for for A, for B, and then for the result. We need to copy memory to A and B. We don't need to worry about R because that's going to be initialized in the parallel four. Um, then we need to get the global ID. So this is a one dimensional uh, SQL ID. So we're just trying to get the the whatever the the index the only index that there is really um, as a global ID and then we're indexing into uh, a and B adding that and saving it to our then we can call wait then copy back and check the result okay so. Let's see what happens. 